Take your Bibles, please, and turn to 1 Corinthians 11. We'll begin there and spend the bulk of our time in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and chapter 10. But I want to remind you of the text from which we've been studying in Ephesians chapter 4 and also remind you that in that text, as we saw that God has given us gifts, um, He's given us the gift of unity that we're to maintain in the Spirit, that He's given us individually spiritual gifts that we're to use to bring to bear on each other, if you will, to move the, the body of Christ along. And He's also given us pastors who teach us and lead us. And so we're asking God to give us even more elders, overseers, uh, pastors to, to help us because the text goes on to tell us that we are to grow up in our maturity in Christ and in our knowledge of the Son of God. And then the text follows with a so that clause. So there's a, a reason. The reason we're to grow up in maturity is so that we won't be blown about by every wind of doctrine, pressed to and fro like children. So like immature believers are sometimes running in every direction, it seems, furiously after the next new thing that's come along. And Paul warns us against that and reminds us that we're to, to grow up and, and solidify our doctrine so that we're not pushed around by ideas that float around. And then he uses a, a phrase, the next phrase, that's often been snatched out of its context as an excuse to speak harshly or, or sort of brutally. He says, speak the truth to one another in love. Now, our good friend Caleb Petrie taught from that text several years ago and, and both taught us a good Bible study skill and, and truth out of the text at the same time. You know, he said, context is king, right? And so you look at the whole text and Paul has been saying, don't be pushed about by every wind of doctrine, rather speak the truth in love. And so he's telling us that the opposite of being pushed about and, and getting sloppy doctrinally and not growing up in the knowledge of the Son of God is to be able to speak the truth, to doctrinally and, and theologically tell truth in order to do it patiently and kindly and compassionately and in love and, and patience, you know, so, and so forth. But th that's not a license just to say what you want. Boy, your dress is ugly. I love you, but your dress is just ugly. Or I love you, but you, your hair is goofy. Or I love you, but you know, that's, that's not the excuse to say whatever you want that's true as long as you do it in love. It's the command to communicate theological truth because that is the thing that's going to help us to grow up in maturity in Christ. So I want to do that over several weeks. Speak the truth in love about some things that may swing us around back and forth and about which there might be confusing ideas doctrinally. And since we're having the supper today, it's a good place for us to start in thinking about the Lord's Supper. Today, too often in churches, there's very little thought given to the supper. It's something that's done sometimes only on special occasions like Christmas and Easter. Sometimes it's done a little more frequently, once a quarter, that's, that was the practice in the church where I grew up. Um, and honestly, I can remember as a boy coming in and seeing the stuff on the table and going, oh, I'm going to be late today. You know, that was all I thought about the supper growing up. And I don't, as far as I remember, no one ever taught me to think any differently about it. It was something that churches did at the end of a service. Um, some people tend to think that the, the supper is a time where you're supposed to be very morbid and introspective and hate yourself and feel bad and feel sorry for Jesus dying on the cross because His body was broken and His blood was poured out and it was your fault and you ought to be miserable because of it. Some people think that the supper is something that they have to skip if they haven't had a good week spiritually. Others think that the supper is a reward for having a great theological week. You know, I've been on my, on my game. And so I'm, I'm worthy of the supper. So some people think that the supper actually becomes the body and the blood of Christ. Some people think that 
God is present in a, in a real way physically in the, the elements. All those ideas are broken and, and are doctrinal winds that have blown people off course over the years and they've, they've been to our, our detriment. And I'm afraid I have to admit that we have not done a lot of careful teaching on the supper. And so because we don't want the supper just to be an afterthought, we don't want you to walk in the, the building once a month and see the supper here, children, boys and girls. We don't want you to walk in and go, oh, it's going to be long today. Now, we want this to be a time of celebration. We want to understand that the supper is a means of grace for God's people. Now, that may be a foreign term or it may be one that we've tossed about and haven't described a whole lot. And so I want to begin there by saying, what is a means of grace? What, what is that? That's the first thing that we want to think about together. And means of grace are things like scripture reading and prayer and uh, worship together and the ordinances, baptism and the Lord's Supper. One author has said that the, the means of grace are the delivery system of God. They're the conduit that God uses to provide for His people the things that they need. It's the, the way that God has chosen to deliver real spiritual power Help, change, courage, and blessing to the needy souls of believers on earth. It's um, a point of ordinary practice that, that we participate in week after week. That's one of the reasons that at Grace Heritage Church we just preach the Bible. We just sing. We just pray. We don't try to do anything clever or unique or creative necessarily so that these things become more meaningful to you because these ordinary means of grace are the things that God has been using to save and mature and grow His people for thousands of years. And so we want to stick to the things that God ordained they're the, the means or the tools or the delivery system, if you will, that God came up with and has ordained or given to His church so that we might be the recipients of His blessings and His provision. The supper is an, an oft-repeated um, ordinance, a means of grace, and if we were to ignore it, I would understand that that would be the same as, as despising or ignoring the body and the blood of Christ. The, the, the substitutionary death of Christ, the work of Christ on the cross, to ignore the supper and not participate in it and not to think rightly about it is not to think rightly about or to ignore the work of Christ on the cross. Because this is one of the primary ways that he's given to think about that. God uses the ordinances, and as we're talking about the supper in particular, to strengthen faith's confidence. To strengthen faith's confidence. It's to strengthen the confidence that we have in God's promises, and it's to call forth, to motivate us, to move us along to acts of faith in response to receiving all of His good gifts. So it strengthens our confidence in the promises of God and it motivates us or moves us along to acts of faith in a response to His good gifts. The effectiveness of the Lord's Supper does not depend on the minister or the setting or the, the temperature of the room or any of those kinds of things. The effectiveness of the supper depends upon the faithfulness of God who is the one who gave us the ordinance. Jesus and the apostles speak of the supper as if it were the body and the blood of Christ. Jesus said, this is my body broken for you. This is my blood shed for you. Now, I said a moment ago that the bread and the, the fruit of the vine don't become the literal body of Christ. And we, need, we understand that Jesus also said, I am the door. Well, Jesus wasn't calling himself a door that swings on hinges. He was using language, symbolic language. But at the same time, as God gives us the supper, and as Jesus and the apostles spoke about the supper, they're saying that to receive the bread and the fruit of the vine is to receive the body and the blood of Christ. 
that in taking the, body, the bread, as we, we take the bread and eat it, as we take the, the fruit of the vine and drink it, that we are by faith take, partaking of the body and the blood of Christ. That we're, we're coming into union with Him. And again, we want to be really careful about how we say this. Now, I'm not trying to make the supper something mystical or more than it is, but I am trying to make it more than we tend to think about it as just some bread and juice and a group of or a set of actions that we go through traditionally. One author says, As the preaching of the word makes the gospel audible, so the supper and baptism make it visible. As the preaching of the word makes the gospel audible, so the supper and baptism make it visible. And God stirs up our faith by both means. So the supper needs to be in our, our minds elevated as a means of grace, a delivery system through which God gives to us gifts that Jesus has acquired for us. Jesus has secured these gifts. He distributes these things to us. And God has decided or ordained that the supper is one of the ways through which God gives to us or supplies to us those gifts. So if those things are true, and if this is a means of grace, and, and if, if what I've said about it is true, how are we to think about it? How are we to respond, if you will, to the supper? What are we supposed to be doing as we're approaching it and as we're taking it? Well, there are three things that I'd like to encourage you to, to consider about this. First of all, the supper is a time to remember. I hope that you're in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and I want to encourage you to find verse 23. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 23. And, and I'm just going to read through verse 26. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So notice that Jesus twice there says that uh, he gave thanks and then he commands the apostles and us to take the supper and do it in remembrance of him. So in the supper we remember how Christ gave himself up for us and we offer him thanks in prayer. We anticipate, you know that on the first Sunday of each month we're going to have the supper. I will try to do a, a better faithful job of reminding you that it's coming. And so in preparation we pray and we thank. And, and before we partake of the meal we thank God for his goodness and provision. Now I'd like to give you something to meditate on perhaps this afternoon. When Jesus gave thanks for the bread. Wouldn't you have loved to have heard that prayer? And I am absolutely convinced that Jesus did not say, God, we thank you for this bread that we're about to receive. Please bless it to the nourishment of our bodies. Rather, I'm inclined to think that it was much more like a John 17 prayer in which Jesus in those moments contemplated how from before the foundation of the earth God had designed a way to redeem His people and to rescue them from sin. And Jesus was thanking God for the perfections of His plan and for the glories of His redemptive mercies. I imagine that Jesus was anticipating what was coming and, and that for his death to be of any real value, his life had to be perfectly righteous. And so he, he thanked God that the, the life that he had lived, that God had given him the strength and energy and power to live it perfectly in obedience, that he had come and he had accomplished everything that the Father had sent him to do. And that he... Now, 
You see how you could go on thinking about that? As we remember with thankfulness what Christ has done, let it be more than just, Jesus, thank you for dying for me on the cross. Let it be a contemplation of how the perfect Lamb of God who was sinless was made sin for us so that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. Let it be a thankfulness to God for the way that, that the wrath of God has fallen on Him and, and He has removed that wrath from us. And let it be a thankfulness for how God the Father ordained a plan to save His elect people from the foundation of the earth and that the, the Son of God went and accomplished all that the Father had ordained and the Holy Spirit of God applied those things unfailingly and perfectly to the hearts of the people of God so that we come to the supper worshiping out of our remembrance of what God has done. Praise be to God the Father and the Son and God the Holy Spirit for all His good and perfect redeeming, saving work. Those are the things that the supper is designed to stir up in us. And even as the Apostle Paul would do, when he starts thinking about the work of Christ, he, he can't help but break into praise. It happens over and over in his letters, and that's what the supper, the supper is a means of God, a means of grace to help us to think on him and, and give him praise and worship, to thank him. Infinitely wonderful gifts call for everlasting thankfulness. And in Psalm 103, the psalmist calls us to remember what the Lord has done and forget not all his benefits. And so the supper is an opportunity for you and me to remember these things, to think on how God saved us and how he's rescued us and how he's forgiven us of sin and how in, well, man, in Romans 5, how Paul says, one sin was enough to condemn us. But Jesus didn't just die for one sin and say, okay, well, you're, you've got one Get out of jail card. You get, for, for one sin, I'll cover you. No, the, the scripture goes on to say that Jesus died for many transgressions. And, and you know the argument. It doesn't mean so we say, well, since Jesus died for a lot of sin, I'm going to sin a lot. No, it, it reminds us that because we're completely sinners, Jesus completely redeems his people. Thanks be to God. So we remember with thankfulness. Secondly, the supper has present spiritual benefits. It causes us to remember the past, but it has present spiritual benefits. Um, I think I was supposed to read something out of the Confession of Faith earlier, but I may have forgotten. But it's on your, t your paper, your notes. Here's the second part of a, of a statement, though, from the Confession about the Lord's Supper. It is given for the confirmation of the faith of believers in all the benefits of Christ's death. And then it talks about those. Their spiritual nourishment and growth in Him. Their further engagement in and to all the duties they owe Him. The supper is to be a bond and a pledge of their communion with Christ and each other. Let's talk about some of those things. And turn back in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, just one chapter there to verse 16. Um, and I guess we'll do the context and, and read verse 14 first. 1 Corinthians 10 verse 14. Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. I speak as to sensible people. Judge for yourselves what I say. The cup of blessing that we bless, is it not... And would you do me just a running commentary translation thing here? There's no indefinite article in the original language and so let's just take the A out. It's, it's okay to do that. The cup of blessing that we bless, is it not participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one bread, we who are many are one body. For we all partake of the one bread. Now Paul's going to go on in this the context here is particularly about the idolatry that's involved in participating in some of the pagan practices and eating meat that's offered at these sacrifices to idols. And he goes on down in verse 20. I imply that what pagans sacrifice they offer to demons and not to God. I do not want you to be participants with demons. And so Paul's making an argument 
that for the people to participate in those pagan services and the, the, the worship of idols is, is to participate, to make a vertical connection, if you will, with demons. There's, there's a real connection that's going on, Paul says. And out of that argument, he's, he's saying that when we participate in the supper, when we take of the body and the blood of Christ or the, the bread and the fruit of the vine, that we're participating in the body of Christ and participating in His blood. And we're connecting himself, ourselves to him. I'm really thankful for Richard Barcelos and a little book that he wrote um, about the Lord's Supper and for the exegesis he's done in this passage because it just springs alive to us as we consider the language that Paul's using here and the fact that he's telling us that in the supper we have real spiritual fellowship with Christ. In partaking of the supper we have real Spiritual fellowship with Christ. And I'm not saying that He is somehow bodily present, but spiritually we have real fellowship with Christ. And the supper supplies blessings to strengthen our faith and nourish our souls and strengthen us for obedience to Christ. So as we, we take of the bread and the fruit of the vine, we remember that the supper does not bring us into relationship with Christ. It's important that we make that distinction. If you're here and you're not a believer, I want to say welcome. We're glad that you're here, but I don't want you to have any confusion about this. If when we pass these trays and you're not a follower of Christ, you should not participate because taking this bread and drinking this juice does not make you a Christian. Those, this is a, a, a supper, an ordinance for believers. So it doesn't bring us into the faith. It is for those who are already in the faith. But for those of you who are in the faith, it certainly does move you along in the faith. One author says the supper does not save us, but it is certainly a part of our sanctification. Another says this passage in 1 Corinthians 10 indicates that there is real fellowship between Christ and His people at the supper. So I think that this is a time to consider and to remember that He is our life. Just as surely as bread is real nourishment to our physical bodies, Christ is real nourishment to our souls. Just as drink is real refreshment to our bodies physically, so Christ is real refreshment to our souls. It might be a time for you to repent of drifting away from Christ and pretending that you do not need Him to grow in the faith. You might have thought that you could do that sort of on your own or on your own terms. Or it might be a time for you to, to cry out to Him to say, Oh God, I need your strength and support and your your." power for this particular area of my life. I'm wrestling to love my spouse well. I am struggling to obey my parents. I'm struggling to do my job as unto the Lord. I, I don't like it. I, I'm bored by it. it. It seems of no value. My bosses are stupid. You know, there are a thousand things that go on in your everyday life that you can only make progress in because of your connection to Christ. And so the supper reminds you of that and gives you the opportunity to look to Him to provide for you in that. That's how the supper, I understand, is, is a means to help us. And then maybe it's just a time to enjoy Christ, to celebrate who He is and to fellowship with Him. In the supper, also, we respond to Christ in covenant renewal. And I want to do this kind of quickly. But I'll remind you, you, you jot this down, Exodus chapter 24, verses 1 to 11. There's a lengthy description of an event in the Old Testament in which the Old Covenant and covenant blood and a meal are connected together. Moses gathers the people together and he sprinkles uh, the blood of a slain lamb, a sacrificed lamb on them. And they promise to obey the Lord. We will do all that the Lord says. And then there, excuse me, is a meal, a covenant meal together. The, the Lord's Supper uh, 
Christ replacing the Passover lamb and the supper replacing the Passover meal, the supper that we partake today now reminds us that we are in a covenant with God through Christ. And this is a covenant renewal meal. We're expressing our love for and our devotion to Christ when we take this bread and the fruit of the vine. So as Paul says, when we take this bread and and this fruit of the vine, we're participating in the body and we're also expressing to Him our love and devotion. We're renewing our covenant. So this gives us the, the regular reminder for those who have been walking with Christ for many years. Maybe sometimes you can forget what you said to Christ when He saved you and when you submitted to Him in repentance and faith, that you said to Jesus, You are my King. I will submit my whole life and my whole heart to You. I belong to You. You have purchased me with Your blood. And and I do not belong to myself, but I belong to You. And so direct my life where You want it. Tell me what how I'm to live in obedience to You. That's what we said when we came to Christ. Jesus didn't just get you out of hell when you die so that you can live however while you're here, right? And the supper reminds you of that. I think about it like when whenever I preach a a wedding, I try to always remind those in the congregation who are married to remember their covenant vows to their spouse. That that that's a great time to remember what you said to your, your husband or your wife as you were marrying them. And so the supper is a great way for us to remember what we said to Jesus when we submitted to Him as our King and our Lord. The the, the supper is also a covenant reminder that we are together in this. Notice what um, Paul says in verse 17. Because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. And so, brothers and sisters, as we partake of the supper today, we're reminded that the believers in the room, that we're connected to each other in a covenant. And we expressed those covenant promises to each other when we became members of this congregation. We said, we believe this is how Christ calls us to live. And so we're in this together. And we're moving towards maturity in Christ together. We need each other. We belong to each other. We cannot get there without each other. (laughs) Any more than my arms can arrive at this church building on Sunday morning without my legs walking out of the house and getting into the car. We can't get to maturity in Christ as a body without each other. And that's because we're connected to one head. So the supper calls us to remember. It also supplies for us present present blessings and reminds us of the, the covenant. It's a renewal of covenant and how we're going to live in relationship to Christ and to each other. But thirdly, the supper anticipates the future. Um, if you'll look back again into chapter 11 at 1 Corinthians 11 verse 26... We're reminded that as often as we eat the bread and drink the cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until He comes. I'll just read for you Matthew 26, verse 29. As Jesus finishes the supper with His disciples, He says, I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. So when Jesus says that He's going to abstain from the meal... He, he indicates that he's going to do that until we sit down at the table with him to drink it in the consummated kingdom, the new heavens and the new earth. However you picture us getting there um, in terms of your eschatology, Jesus is saying that we ought to anticipate one day doing this again with him in God's kingdom. And when Paul says in 1 Corinthians that we're going to eat and drink this bread, he's not just saying that we're going to do this for a really long time. 
But he's saying that we're going to do this until it becomes no longer necessary. And I think that's a really significant distinction to make. We're going to partake of the supper until it is no longer necessary. Now, now we may die and go to be with Christ before he returns and before the consummation, but the church, the body of Christ, will keep taking the supper until it's no longer necessary. And so I would encourage you as you're thinking about the supper and as you're, you're anticipating taking it and even as it's being passed, that one thing you might pray for is that the kingdom of God will come. Pray for the gospel to be spread to the nations. Pray that, that missionaries and, and people who are sharing the gospel with their neighbors and their children and with folks in places where it's difficult to do that and dark places that they'll know success. That God will show favor on the, the gospel going forth to the nations. Gathering the, the, the elect of God to Himself. Filling churches with His people so that the gospel is accomplishing all that it is designed to accomplish. Pray that the kingdom will come, that God would bring things to a, a culmination. Anticipate the full benefit of all that we'll experience in Christ. The supper is a taste of heaven on earth that looks to the day when Jesus will drink the fruit of the vine with us. It's way more than something stuck on the end of a sermon. Man, it's, a, it's, a, it's an exciting anticipation. It looks to the day when He will bring all things that He's promised to fruition and it also looks to the day when pain and sorrow and suffering will be no more for the believer. It anticipates the day when justice will be completely done and no evil will remain. It anticipates the day when the last vestiges of sin and death and the enemies of God will be vanquished. It anticipates the day when every relationship will be made right. It looks to the day when every loss will be filled up and every wrong will be made right and every hindrance to all that God has created us to do as His people will be wiped away. What a day the supper anticipates. And so it, it raises us out of the, the doldrums of, of daily grind by supplying to us power and anticipating what God is going to do. But until that day, don't miss the present help. For until that day, we are still in this life. And we're still in sometimes various degrees of sorrow and suffering and difficulty. And we need the presence and the blessings of Jesus to persevere. Brothers and sisters, He is our only hope. And all of that is guaranteed and provided for us because Jesus has lived and He has died and He has been raised again. The supper reminds us of that. And so this we remember and count upon and anticipate in the supper. So let's take a moment to prepare our hearts again and remember that this is, um, this is not the time when you try to whip yourself into worthiness but times when you can remember with thankfulness when you can cry out for blessings and you can anticipate what God is going to do Let's take just a couple of moments quietly to, to pray and thank God and, and, uh, and participate in those ways. And then I'll call you men to come and help me deliver the, the su supper.
Father, the Scriptures are your means of grace for us, and we pray that you would be pleased to work in our midst this day and supply for our hearts what we need through your Word, reminding us of what Christ has done, thanking you for the blessings that are ours because of Christ, anticipating the provision of Christ for eternity. And now as we express our faith, use again another means of grace, the the Lord's Supper, to strengthen us, to um, remind us, to rebuke, to correct, to instruct and help us to follow in obedience to Christ. Help us to celebrate His death until He comes. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.